Hi, everyone. Hi, David. Let's just give it a few more minutes. Lots of people still logging on at great speed here. So. Thanks, Terry. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our seminar series. We have the, our long-awaited guest, Cesar Rodriguez Garvito. David is going to introduce him, but I just want to say at the beginning that we are extremely lucky to have him with us, and he brings unbelievable experience on human rights and the law and its implications or leverage for both biodiversity and climate change, but I will let David dig into those details. And David's also offered to um, provide the land acknowledgement today. So welcome, Caesar. I'm hugely looking forward to this. And David, I will turn the mic over to you. Well, thanks very much, Terry. Uh, so I'm actually on Pender Island today, which is also known as Sadeus, which means uh, Island of the Wind. And that is in the Coast Salish territory. And I'd just like to say, because it's germane to uh, Cesar's experience as well, that many of us are living on in indigenous lands here in British Columbia that were never the subject of treaty settlements or any other form of legal taking. And so it's really a fascinating place to be in the year 2020, because we have a situation where the Canadian legal system is still grappling with how to uh, overcome this historical injustice of the, the taking of indigenous lands without any form of legal appropriation. And so um, having said that, it, it is an absolute delight to be introducing uh, Cesar Rodriguez Garavito to the IRES community today. Cesar is, uh, as you've all seen his impressive bio, he's the director of the Center for, Glo for Human Rights and Global Justice at the New York University School of Law. But more than that, I would say that Cesar is the most amphibious person I know. And by amphibious, I mean he is the ultimate scholar practitioner. Uh, you know, his, his academic record is nothing short of brilliant. His, his books, his writings, he's got a law degree, three master's degree and a PhD. He's been a visiting scholar at 10 or 12 different universities. Um, but for me, what's really extraordinary about Cesar is his activism and he has served as the executive director of De Justicia, which is a leading uh, environmental or civil society organization in Colombia. But I really think that, and it, you know, Cesar is a very modest guy, but let me just give you one example of his, of his advocacy. So when I said amphibious, I mean, he, he transverses two lands. I don't mean that he's capable of living in water and on land, although who knows, he may be that as well. But He's, uh, he's at home both in the, in the academy and out there in the world. And two examples of his work out there in the world. One, he was the lawyer for a group of 25 Colombian children and youth in one of the world's most important lawsuits related to climate change and human rights. And on behalf of those 25 young people, he filed a lawsuit against the government of Colombia, arguing that the human rights of these young people, and in particular, the constitutional right to a healthy environment, was being violated by the Colombian government's failure to stop deforestation in the Amazon. And not surprisingly, uh, on behalf of those young people, Cesar won that case. The Supreme Court of Colombia issued a, a really globally important precedent, finding that the right to a healthy environment, the right to water and other human rights are being violated by deforestation and its implications for climate change. And Cesar also is, uh, is it, he gives back more than he takes. And one of my other favorite anecdotes about Cesar is that seven years ago, he created a program 
for people like himself, for people who are action researchers, uh, particularly people from the global south. And since 2013, Cesar has been bringing upwards of uh, 20 to 25 people together, human rights advocates from the global south, and training them in this field of amphibious research so that they can be scholars and activists, taking them out into the field in Colombia to different sites where human rights are implicated and teaching them about uh, and learning from them about activism, about communication, about advocacy. And so uh, I'm gonna stop there and turn the mic over to my friend and one of the most inspiring people I've ever met, Cesar Rodriguez Garavito. Thank you, David. Thanks much. Uh, David, that's, of course, overly generous, but that's how David is, so I'm not surprised. <laughs> so you have to discount everything he said by a factor of, what, well, 50%, by 50 at least. Uh, but I'm really honored and pleased to be here with you all. I've heard so much about IRS and uh, from David and other colleagues, people who have interacted with this community over the years. And uh, the only thing that I regret is not being able to be there in person. Uh, and I needed, I had uh, the opportunity to invite, to be invited to Vancouver twice this year. And it, it so happened that the first invitation was about to take place just as the pandemic hit. And, but hopefully, before too long, we'll have a chance to, to interact in person. And I'm particularly impressed and also thankful for the invitation because of the interdisciplinary nature uh, of, this, of the Institute. I can assure you that I will not be giving a technical legal talk. Uh, I you know, partly, part of what it tells to try to be amphibious or to traverse different worlds is to be able to speak to different audiences. Uh, so I have a very lawyerly version of this talk that I've given to other audiences. I will spare you that version. And, uh, and what I'm gonna try to do, because I also am very interested to hear what uh, your thoughts are about the use of litigation as a means to um, make headway towards goals that uh, uh, most of us, if not all of us here share, meaning uh, environmental conservation, uh, climate action, uh, biodiversity preservation, and uh, and um, and renewal, and so on. So I'm going to deliberately take a socio legal approach. My uh, my training mission was in law and philosophy, but my PhD is in sociology. So I really try to apply social science tools to the study and the practice of the law. Uh, and in fact, the piece that uh, uh, David generously referred to amphibious research was uh, originally written for a sociology journal. Uh, and uh, the case that I try to make in that, um, in that uh, article is that there is a space for scholar practitioners or practitioner scholars that you don't have to live a uh, uh, split life uh, and that uh, that type of practice can and should be validated both in academia and in, in the world of, of uh, human rights and social justice practice. So the broader project of which this presentation is part really tries to uh, ask four questions. First of all, why is it that we have seen the rise of uh, the use of litigation uh, to advance climate action uh, and litigation that is based squarely on human rights arguments over the last five years, basically? I'll show you. Um, a slide in a moment that shows that out of 60, roughly 60 cases uh, anywhere around the world that have been filed before national, international courts and quasi-judicial institutions, you know, all the way from, uh, uh, from the Supreme Courts, for example, an ongoing case in Brazil, uh, to cases before the United Nations Human Rights Committee. Uh, of course, to many of these cases, uh, um, uh, David has made a key contribution to, and also the former rapporteur, uh, John Knox. Uh, why is it that we've seen this trend rising and expanding over the last five years? So a socio sociological question there. Second, what is this about? A more descriptive question. What type of cases are being brought to is five social movement? What is the role of scientists? And if there, I know there's a number of 
scientists, engineers in this crowd. Well, scientists are playing a very important active role uh, in, in these games. Third, what, how, is, how are courts responding? Because these are not easy cases. And it's a, just five years ago, it wasn't clear whether courts had any role to play in such a complex issue as, for example, uh, climate change mitigation, right? Let alone adaptation. So that's, that's another question. And, and finally, uh, well, it is for, for me question, the question of so what? What are, what are the impacts? So does this make a difference, right? Because in the end, both scholars and practitioners want to make a difference by taking, you know, the, 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 making a decision and, and doing all the job of the work that it entails to, uh, to uh, bring a case to the court, litigate it for a number of years, and then work on the implementation of cases. Um, I won't have time today to elaborate on each of those lines of, of, uh, of uh, inquiry. I'd be happy to uh, take any questions on any of those trends uh, during the Q&A. That I'm finishing up a, a long article that does um, take on all these questions. Uh, but today, I thought that I would focus on a piece, uh, on a couple of pieces of that puzzle, of that broader picture. First, I, I'm keen to show you the result, the more descriptive results of the research because, well, first, because it's been a lot of work, but second, because uh, importantly, because it's important to characterize and to see what this is about and also what the blind spots are. So if any of you as a student, scientist, scholar is interested in supporting, in joining, in, in following, uh, new cases and they're being filed literally every week these days. I keep updating the, my database literally every week. Um, but um, there was no database on cases of this sort before this study, so I'm, I'm keen to share the results uh, with you. Again, my universe is all court cases uh, that have been filed to um, speed up climate mitigation or climate ad adaptation on human rights grounds, on human rights arguments, using human rights arguments. So the climate rights connection is at the core of the project. And then I'll, I'll say something about what uh, uh, courts have been saying in response to these cases. So what are the, uh, I'm calling this the emerging norms. It's too early to tell whether this is going to, all of these doctrines and norms uh, are sticking. Uh, but since this became a pretty active field of advocacy and now research as well, uh, this is likely to be with us uh, for a long time. And I'm interested in seeing these norms and seeing the responses from courts and what courts are saying about human rights and climate change in this formative stage. Okay, with that, let me move forward more quickly with the help of a slideshow here. So in terms of, of uh, the number of cases, before 2015, uh, a total of eight cases had been filed anywhere in the world um, on climate change that had used explicitly human rights arguments. So I'm using only cases in which either the plaintiffs or the courts explicitly use um, human rights norms and arguments and frames. After 2015, and I'll say something about the timing, um, there have been uh, 50, uh, uh, 51 cases. Uh, and the latest one was recently filed last week in, in a couple of weeks ago in Spain. In terms of where this is happening, before 2015, the US and Australia were the dominant sites of climate litigation. Now, as you uh, may know, both jurisdictions, both um, the US and Australia, are pretty uh, impervious to human rights arguments, especially international human rights arguments. It's really hard to uh, win a case or even to file a case based on human rights argument that goes to trial in any of those two jurisdictions. So it really, this trend has been led by other regions, right? Europe, quite prominent, so 41% of these cases uh, have taken place in Europe. Uh, then there is uh, the Global South, Latin America, Asia Pacific, Africa, and then there's an interesting trend in the filing of cases before regional courts and, and, and uh, 
judicial bodies like the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, Inter-American Court of Human Rights, or the UN Committees on uh, Human Rights and other uh, on various types of rights. To be more specific, I'll show you a few pictures. I won't have time to go into the details of these cases. They're all rich stories. Happy to elaborate on any of them. The Q&A. Uh, probably the, the most uh, well-known case is your agenda case filed in 2013 in the Netherlands, but uh, uh, it's first the first court ruling, lower court ruling, took place in, two, five, in 2015. Long story short, Urgenda, an environmental organization in the Netherlands, sued the Dutch government, alleging that the mitigation target, the promise to cut down uh, carbon emissions that the government had committed to, was too was uh, too low. That because of historical emissions, because of of the uh, of the wealth of the country, that according to the IPCC the Netherlands had to commit to a higher level uh, of carbon emission reduction by 2020. Very recently, December 2019, the Dutch Supreme Court upheld uh, the lower court's rulings and this was a historic case in which uh, the court said, yes, you're absolutely right. In order for the uh, Dutch government not to violate uh, the Dutch citizens' uh, rights, rights, rights to health, right to uh, private life, right to physical integrity, right to life, uh, a commitment aligned with science, with the best science, the consensus science that we have coming out of the IPCC, that target needs to be implemented and, and carbon um, emission uh, reduction needs to happen faster. And the government complied and this has rolled out a whole set of policies just this year, for example, shutting down coal fired plants um, this year. Very quickly, the other ones, I won't have time to uh, go into details. I'm going to give you a one liner uh, for each of them. Uh, the case that uh, David mentioned in Colombia, uh, which I co-led with colleagues at the Justicia, which is the organization that continues to uh, oversee and, and, and work hard on the implementation of this ruling and which, by the way, hosts um, the workshops uh, for Global South uh, Advocates that David mentioned in his introduction. So I won't say more because David generously uh, described this case already. Uh, <clears throat> there are cases that are that that some people might be surprised that uh, I include in this in this database because they seem to be unrelated to uh, human rights. So some of you may have heard about. Uh, court decision in the UK by a high court in mid-2020, June, July, that basically for all practical purposes stopped uh, the, the process that was leading to the construction of a third runway in Heathrow Airport. And the, although the ruling was not based on human rights arguments, it was more of a technical administrative law issue, issue the plaintiffs had uh, made a very powerful and, to my mind, uh, convincing argument uh, that uh, by committing to or by approving the construction of a third runway leading to the explosion of carbon emissions in, uh, produced by the Heathrow Airport, the government was um, violating its human rights commitments um, at the European level and at the global level. So uh, this is uh, a win for now. More recently, and you can tell from the picture that this is recent. Um, Ireland also, a recent case, is, um, the Supreme Court of Ireland also um, ruled for the plaintiffs in a, in a case similar to Regenda. And finally, just to tell you, just to give you a sense of how this is happening as we speak, uh, this is a case before the Brazilian Supreme Court against the disastrous Bolsonaro policies of that have led to the dramatic increase of fires in the Amazon. The person to the left is the presiding judge in that case, Justice Barroso. And, uh, and what the uh, activists and some political parties in Brazil have um, uh, argued in that case is that by failing to uh, implement or, uh, and actually to use uh, funds that had been set aside to fight deforestation in the Amazon, um, the Brazilian government is violating the rights of both present and future generations. 
And this is the status. Of course, many of these cases are relatively young. This is why uh, definitive conclusions cannot be drawn. But um, so most of these cases are pending, are either uh, uh, at the trial stage or have or are on appeal 68%. And then in terms of uh, the uh, percentage of granted versus denied cases, the, the distribution is relatively even, um, as you see in this um, slide. Moving on to what's lying behind this trend. Now, uh, from a socio-legal perspective, this is called legal mobilization. Basically, the use of law to advance social change causes. And of course, that concept, that frame doesn't apply only to the environment of climate change, but it applies across the board. So there, there's, there are fantastic studies, if some of you may have seen them or would be interested in taking a look at that literature, uh, explaining how, for instance, um, um, same-sex marriage was a cause that was litigated carefully thought about the, by movements throughout the years. Uh, and then finally, after uh, legal movements turned to, the, turned to the courts after defeat in, at several junctures, in many countries, they managed to change the law and change kind of the, uh, also the culture around that particular institution. So in this case, what's interesting and, and what I'm trying to explain in this project is why is it that the tipping point or the turning point seemed to have happened around 2015. And there are several reasons. Uh, some are legal and some are non-legal. On the non-legal side, for example, as you know better than I do, the IPCC uh, definitely in its 2018 report, but also in, in reports uh, around the mid 20, uh, 2010s, started to be more assertive and also more explicit about the human impacts of, of climate change, right? So it's, it had always produced good science, uh, but it, it, the issue of climate change used to be seen as something that affected the ecosystems, even animals, polar bears, but not so clearly um, uh, human uh, beings. In fact, the very first case that was filed uh, along these lines was uh, in 2005 by the, by the Inuit people uh, before against the, US, the United States in 2005 before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And, uh, and in a great paper uh, about this case, uh, a couple of researchers um, interviewed some of the plaintiffs and they said, well, what we wanted to do is to change the frame of, uh, of how that was used to speak about climate change from an issue uh, that affected polar bears to an issue that affected also those people like the Inuit that depend on the survival of uh, fauna and flora and resources in the places where polar bears uh, uh, have lived um, for many uh, years and, and decades and centuries. So the year here, 2015, you will recognize quickly was the year of the uh, Paris COP and the Paris Agreement 2015. I won't go into the details of this slide. I'll all, I, I, my um, goal here is just to suggest, and, and this is or not by the research, that it was a combination of developments in the human rights world, both in the activism of human rights organizations and environmental organizations on the one hand, and developments in the climate change regime that led to the uh, Paris Agreement 2015 uh, that explained and produced what legal uh, mobilization scores called uh, uh, a propitious structure of, of, of opportunities, meaning a legal framework that was conducive uh, for litigation at the national level. So once Paris was in place, Paris also, the Paris Agreement mentions in its preamble, uh, human rights, and then also, thanks to the work of, uh, of the UN Rapporteurship on Environmental and Human Rights and other uh, key agencies and key organizations that pushed for many years for human rights um, intergovernmental organizations and human rights NGOs to get serious about climate change. Finally, around 2015, we see the convergence of science, law, and also importantly, uh, the media starting to cover 
uh, uh, starting to cover climate change issues as a, 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 in terms of their, uh, of their human impact as opposed to the impact of only on um, quote unquote nature, if that distinction makes any sense. I, I don't believe that that distinction makes much uh, scientific sense anymore, but, uh, but I won't go into that into the details. Basically here, don't worry, I won't go into each of these bullet points, but the idea here is that each of these sides of the, of, uh, of the equation contributed something to what we now see in uh, happening in this case. Moving on to the last part of my presentation, because I'm keen to open it up to a uh, conversation. I'm going to end with two um, conclusions. One on emerging norms. So what is it that we're seeing as movements and, uh, and uh, activists uh, and other civil society collectives take these issues to court? And um, what is it that we're seeing in terms of what are, what are courts saying that the law should be uh, to like to uh, respond to the climate emergency? One is an emerging, and again, this is baby steps. This is not uh, by any means settled uh, issues, if, you know, settled law. We see signs of emergence uh, of uh, the right to a stable or a livable climate system. This is clearer uh, in some countries and regions. For example, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights has come close to saying just this, uh, that the, the right to a healthy environment includes the right uh, to a livable climate system, right? Of course, uh, um, and, and in some other um, cases, courts have said this more indirectly, but in terms of the filings and in terms of the lawsuits, this is one of the goals of, of this trend towards uh, rights-based climate mitigation. Yeah. Second, and this is, here in what courts are saying, courts may review the targets and the policies that governments establish, set up to deal with the climate emergency. Right? And this is by no means, it may seem commonsensical to many of us, but this is, this is a complicated legal and political issue because of course in, in many countries, uh, courts have been highly differential vis-a-vis uh, -vis governments in anything with regards to anything related to environmental policy and um, including climate change. So the one big case in the US, which is ongoing thanks to the efforts of an organization called um, um, Our Children's Trust, the Juliana case, it's been litigated for almost 10 years now. Uh, the latest decision in a protracted legal battle um, said that courts have nothing to do with huge problems like climate change, right? That these are unjusticiable in that they're so complex and multifaceted that they need to be tackled by elected uh, representatives, meaning uh, legislative, uh, the legislative branch and the executive. This is by no means the, this is the exception rather than the rule in the existing um, uh, body of, of, uh, of, jurisprudence, of jurisprudence. Uh, emerging from these cases. In most cases, even courts that in the end have concluded that um, the government is doing the right thing, they've said that the government's discretion is not absolute, that they cannot choose not to have a policy, for instance. Right? In a well-known case in Pakistan in 2015, uh, the Lahore courts uh, asserted that by not implementing its own legal framework um, on climate adaptation, and, and, and Pakistan is one of the uh, worst hit countries in terms of climate change impacts, uh, that, that the government did not have a choice about uh, 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 not to do something about climate uh, urgently and at, this, and, and at the required scale. So this is an encouraging development. Uh, courts do have a role. And the question, of course, is, what they should do, what type of remedies they should establish, and, and, uh, and to what extent they should get involved. Uh, very importantly, and this is more from a sociological angle than from a legal angle, regardless of the outcome 
of the cases. One interesting development is that because there is this disconnect at the moment between a relatively stagnant process of international negotiations at the, at the global level, meaning that uh, the Paris Agreement has not had the expected effect yet, a new round of negotiations um, depending on what happens in, in the US and, and elsewhere in terms of the elections, doesn't look uh, very promising that the, that uh, litigants and social movements like, uh, like uh, Plan B or Extinction Rebellion, uh, that are behind some of these cases in, in, uh, in the UK, that, or Greenpeace that's been very active around the world, that they have been the vectors of dissemination, of domestication, of the international consensus, scientific consensus. They have basically used the law to translate the recommendations coming out of the IPCC report into domestic policy. This is exactly what happened in the agenda case. So very important socio-legal function. And finally, and this is a complicated uh, ethical scientific issue, fair share. So how do we allocate responsibility um, for climate action? Right? Is it, there's all kinds of debates here and different criteria. Do governments, are governments responsible for um, compensating their historical emissions or, or their current emissions? Are corporations like the big fossil fuel companies also legally responsible to compensate for the uh, tons of, of carbon that they have uh, emitted or have or, or their or, or the fossil fuel that they have dug out uh, have emitted over the over the years. Finally, challenges. Uh, oh, but I, I forgot to say in terms of fair share, the some decisions like the agenda decision and others have gone uh, sort of very far in terms of clarifying the extent of this. Uh, of the of the responsibility and the idea of the fair share actually is used in the agenda case to say that regardless of uh, of uh, of what other countries do, what other uh, other governments do, each and every country, every state has to fulfill its the, its fair share of responsibility. It has to contribute to climate action regardless of whatever anyone else does around the world. And finally, challenges. Of course, this is a highly complicated scientific and legal issue, so there are outstanding uh, dilemmas. One has to do with causality, the multi-causality, and I don't have to explain this in the, to this audience, but I'll translate the, how this plays out in uh, legal fora. So just as it is difficult to paint down the source of uh, or the cause of, a, of an extreme weather event, be it a drought, fire, um, typhoon, hurricane, and so on. It is difficult to attribute a, a given climate harm, say the, the forceful relocation of uh, the whole population of a country that needed to be evacuated because uh, it's an island, small island nation, and it's going under. Uh, so so it, the causal uh, link between that extreme effect, which of course violates all kinds of human rights, and the source of emissions that, that the plaintiffs may choose as defendant. So imagine that they sued um, the 19 or the 50 uh, biggest fossil fuel companies, as they did in a case in the Philippines that uh, before the Human Rights uh, Commission. The judge and the scientists need to try to establish causality in order to attribute legal responsibility. The progress on attribution science has helped a lot. So the fact that scientists these days can say, well, the, this extreme weather event was made more likely by global warming, warming that is already um, that goes some way towards telling judges 
what they what they can do and what type of responsibility they can uh, establish uh, in a given case. One limitation that has more to do with the human rights architecture and the human rights frame is that most harms will happen in the future. So climate change, of course, is here with us, but it'll get worse even before it gets, it gets better if we do something about it uh, soon. As we know, there are locked in effects and human rights, the human rights language and the human rights of the, of the, of the strategies in human rights activism are geared towards addressing past violations, right? So for example, the, the fact that uh, during a certain armed conflict, atrocious human rights violations were committed. So that's what transitional justice and peace and reconciliation and the international tribunals are for. Human rights as a, as a tool and as a community, they are much less helpful when it comes to addressing uh, uh, and anticipating and preventing uh, future harms. And by the way, a big gap, a big land spot in human rights thinking and advocacy is uh, the rights of future generations. And this is why many of these cases are being brought on behalf of young people and, and some young people have themselves taken some of these cases to various legal avenues, uh, legal venues. For example, Greta Thunberg and a number of uh, young activists filed a case before the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child against the uh, major um, um, uh, government polluters. Uh, so this, this, is, this remains a challenge. If uh, under a conventional understanding of human rights, under a kind of a textual interpretation of international human rights, we, the current generations, the present generations, could deplete the, 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 the resources, the planet from its resources and leaving nothing to future generations while being fully in compliance with international human rights law. Because 1945, the UN Declaration and so on, 1948, uh, no one was thinking seriously about any of these intertemporal effects. And now this is um, this needs to be addressed. And, and finally, one stumbling block for many litigants and, and activists is showing injury. And this has technical word in, in, in legal aid, which is standing. So one has to show that one has been particularly injured, that, when it's, that the, the harm that I'm suffering is different and more serious than the harm that other um, similarly located uh, citizens or, or, or human rights uh, uh, holders uh, are situated in. And this has been tricky because some courts have said, well, everyone is affected by climate change. So no one has a particular claim over uh, climate harms and therefore they've thrown out some of these cases on, on, scan, on, basis, on the basis of scan. I'll, I'll stop there and just by saying, finally, one thing that in terms of blind stuff, I just say this quickly. There are many more cases about climate mitigation than about climate adaptation. So around 90% in, uh, of cases in my database are about mitigation and only 10% about adaptation. And this is striking because if you think about what human rights are about, well, the, the adaptation, meaning that the fact that some communities are, I mean, are relocating to uh, areas that are less exposed to uh, the extreme impacts of climate change, or the fact that uh, uh, the health of uh, millions of people in cities is being heavily impacted by the worse, the, the, the compounding effects of pollution and global warming, all of those individual harms could be more easily framed in terms of human rights than the macro level impacts that one can um, uh, attribute to the fact that a country has uh, is promising to lower uh, uh, climate mitigation target. And, and finally, there's also a dearth of litigation against corporations as opposed to governments. Okay. Uh, 
end here and happy to take questions. Tom. Thank you, Cesar. That was fabulous, especially that landscape of the post 2015 situation. And I'm sure we've all got more questions than answers that might be there. We have a tradition here of starting with uh, student questions, two of those at first, and then turning over to the full audience. But uh, David's agreed to field those. So if people have questions, uh, please send them his way. And I will watch for your electronic hands in the meantime. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Cesar. We have uh, questions are coming in fast and furious here. Uh, Francisco asks, how effective are these legal actions or do they have significant impact on the environmental degradation causes? Uh, and Francisco adds, given that as far as he knows, the Colombian and Brazilian Amazon deforestation remains high, if not getting higher. So I think this goes to your uh, initial question of, so what? So maybe you could elaborate. That's a, that's a very important question. Uh, I've uh, litigated and done uh, research on socioeconomic rights, meaning rights like the right to health, the right to housing, right to education, uh, that I find uh, structurally uh, uh, similar uh, to the type of rights that are being litigated in these environmental climate change cases. And in those studies, uh, and in many other studies, there, hum, there, there are some important lessons for um, gauging and also increasing the impact of climate litigation based on human rights. So first, uh, I think there's a lot more attention these days to the moment of implementation of rulings uh, than there used to be. There used to be litigants who were very happy to celebrate because these cases are hard to litigate, but uh, uh, used to be the case that litigants, most litigants stopped uh, their efforts at the moment of the uh, handing down of a legal ruling, a positive legal ruling. So there was a moment of celebration, but nothing really happened uh, afterwards. That's changed. Definitely some of the cases, for example, uh, a very well-known case in, in India on the right to food had a 15-year process of implementation of the Supreme Court's ruling that led to very sizable effects on uh, access to food uh, in India. Extrapolating from those lessons, uh, uh, and by the way, there is, for those of you who may be interested in looking at um, some of these cases and also reading uh, from the litigants and from the researchers who are uh, studying uh, them, the, um, we recently launched a special blog series in an online portal called Open Global Rights. And uh, um, the um, blog series is called Litigating the Climate Emergency. So uh, it's open access, feel free to access it. And there are some discussions there on implementation. I'll end the, the answer by saying, it's too, the, 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 from an academic point of view, the challenge here is that these cases are young. So in order for a researcher to evaluate whether a case has made a difference, one needs a longer window of observation. In the cases that I studied on socioeconomic rights, well, there were you know, cases had been around for 15 years, 10 years already. So this is when you see what the direct, indirect effects, the, the effects on public opinion, the effects on policy have, have been or have not been. So far, so stay tuned and, and or even better, write thesis about this, <laughs> write dissertations about this, do studies about this. It's fascinating work because this is the stuff that, uh, uh, that sociologists and social scientists are best at doing, right? They're looking at what happens on the ground. You do the interviews, you look at the numbers, for example, Francisco's uh, question about looking at deforestation rate. That's one, that's of course one indicator. But bear in mind that litigants and also courts make a difference also in ways other than the more obvious, the changing the more obvious indicators. So for instance, if most of the impact, I would say the more long lasting impact of cases say on, 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 a, on same sex marriage had to do with the changing perceptions about same sex marriage, right? Regard, of course, the difference in specific lives of people who benefited to equal rights is of course priceless. But from a cultural societal point of view, 
it was probably the change of perceptions that there that the, all individuals uh, have equal rights to get married that made the, made more of a of a long term difference. Likewise, if the cases even if the, some of the cases are lost on in terms of the asks of of, uh, of litigants to the courts, if they raise the profile of the issue, if they set the agenda like they're doing now in Brazil, if they make this visible in ways that would not have been possible without the, the lawsuit, then one should definitely count that as a, as a form of impact. I see there are more uh, questions here. Yeah, so, um, so thank you for that. And Cesar, I'll just add that um, one of Cesar's books is called Radical Deprivation on Trial, um, which looks at the impacts of judicial activism on socioeconomic rights in the global south. One of the most thought provoking uh, and brilliant academic treatises I've, I've ever read. So if people are interested in looking at the impacts of these kinds of litigation in non environmental contexts, I highly recommend that book. Uh, we have a couple more questions about specific cases, Cesar. One about, are you familiar with the RWE case, which the Peruvian case? Um, and then a second question about whether you're familiar with Ecuador's case of, uh, against Colombia regarding glyphosate spraying um, and whether, yeah. whether, whether there's lessons we can learn from those two cases. Yes, so these are two important cases. They're not in my database because well, the first one was not argued on human rights grounds. Uh, it was argued on, on more private law and, and corporate liability grounds, but I am, I am familiar with it. The um, lawyer Honda is one of the pioneer uh, lawyers in the climate litigation space. I interviewed her for my uh, research. This is what I spent uh, my summer on this in addition to being in, under lockdown. So I, I, the good thing was that I, got, I had a chance to do a lot of Zoom calls with these great practitioners and, and she was one of them. And so this is an important case uh, specifically because I wish Rocio explained the case, probably she's more familiar with, with me than, than me than, uh, uh, with, the, with the facts. But basically it is a case against an energy company, German energy, energy company brought before German courts on behalf of a Peruvian citizen, right? Alleging that uh, the impact of climate change, basically the melting of glaciers, right? That is going, uh, is directly affecting the life and livelihood of this person. And, and of course, many others in, in Peru. It's a fascinating strategy, not easy because it means it entails what lawyers call extraterritorial obligations, meaning effects of an entity that's headquartered somewhere, in this case, Germany, on the rights of individuals who are, who are based elsewhere in Peru. And the law, and this is a challenge uh, for the legal profession, if there's any lawyer there, in addition to David and myself, the law is, is way behind. Uh, the natural sciences in terms of thinking ecosystemically. So both David and myself are very interested and in, uh, have made such a, a contrib an important contribution to the literature at least yet, but uh, David did write a whole book on the rights of nature. So that, that thinking that uh, what happens in one place is interconnected with effects in other jurisdictions has that realization that's obvious to a biologist, to an ecologist, to a climate scientist, that hasn't, um, ha that hasn't been fully adopted, embraced by uh, the law. So we have these artificial um, compartments uh, of national jurisdictions that make it very hard to argue cases like the RWE. But the encouraging news is that the German courts did take that case. They take, they're, they're taking a look at it. They could have thrown it off and, and they didn't. So I'm hoping that uh, we'll get some interesting answers uh, and pioneer answers from that court. About the Ecuador case against Colombia, that is not in my database because it's not on climate change. Uh, so it really is about um, transboundary harm and about environmental impact. Uh, Glyphosate, as we all know, is highly poisonous uh, pesticide, and, uh, and it was used. Um, uh, it is being used still 
uh, or have been used for many years uh, in, in Colombia. And the question is, well, what about the transboundary impact on Ecuadorian, uh, uh, Ecuadorian citizen? Uh, because again, environmental impacts, they don't care about uh, artificial national boundaries. So uh, I think, again, the lesson to respond to Grace's question is that the law needs to catch up to natural sciences in terms of understanding the interrelation of natural entities and also of uh, humans and uh, nature. Kai. Um, Actually, Cesar, we also have a couple other students. Kai's a prof, so prof's bat okay. last. So we have uh, questions from Annie Lalande and Mario Waba. So Annie, uh, your chance, just unmute yourself sure. and fire away. Sure, thank you. My, uh, thank you very much for the fantastic presentation. Um, I, my question is actually a little bit in line with, um, with Kajan's question. I was wondering in terms of demonstrating injury, generally how small does the affected population need to be in comparison with the general population? I'm not coming from a law background at all, but I think this is fascinating as a concept. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So one of the good things about human rights as a frame, so human rights is not only a body of law. It's also a way of speaking, of making sense of the world. Uh, and one great advantage of human rights is that numbers don't matter as much as, uh, as they do in, say, in economic frames. Uh, so as you know, at least traditional economics is very wedded to utilitarianism as a, as a moral frame. So if, according to orthodox interpretations of that framework, if so if, if an individual is affected by a decision that benefits the majority, well, that's cost benefit. The, the, and this is the argument for, um, say, uh, extractive industries in uh, embracing extractive industries, the uh, projects in, in the Amazon and elsewhere. Well, because if the majority benefits, then you can sacrifice a, an individual. That logic is not um, germane to human rights. So you, it doesn't depend on the size of the group. It depends on, on, the, on, the, um, on the seriousness of the impact and of the type of right that is being affected. So if the life of one person is being affected by, um, sorry, I'm, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, for example, it was yes, very well. Enough. So, to, so if the right of one individual or a small community, like uh, an indigenous community being displaced or being pushed out of their lands by an extractive uh, um, project um, are affected, that counts and that would be ground for uh, legal intervention. Thank you, Cesar. Um, Mario, did you want to ask a question as well? Yeah, hi Caesar, and thanks for a great um, talk. Um, I was just wondering, are we anywhere close to reaching a transnational legal institution on environmental rights? I know the idea was floated around in some of the recent COP talks, uh, but I also know that it didn't get anywhere. And what are the legal challenges to conducting an international environmental court? Um, is it merely just recognition of states or, or are there things beyond that? Mm -hmm. Good question as well. Short answer is that's a big challenge. It probably won't happen in the near future to be very realistic um, because, well, first, first of all, as we know, the international negotiations of international, of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a treaty, even a, a soft law or non-binding agreement have been, you know, protracted and highly complex and even the encouraging development in 2015 in, in Paris uh, has, not, has not been translated into the type of progress that the international community foresaw back then because it was supposed that the, the mechanism in Paris and the Paris Agreement is such that there is supposed to be a ratcheting up dynamic, right? So commitments need to be ratcheted up because as we know, the current commitments of governments around the world are ridiculously modest relative to the, what needs to happen between now and 2030, the halving of, of, of emissions by 2030. So that on the, on the international agreement side, 
I'm not particularly, I'm optimistic, but I don't, I, I, I am I'm afraid this is going to happen too late, if, if at all. Then courts are kind of a one degree removed from uh, negotiations uh, and you would need also an international cons quasi consensus or, or international critical mass of states um, for the creation of any court uh, of this type. So I would say that if the international agreement itself is, is, an, is an uphill battle, uh, the, an international court is not uh, uh, on the cards for now. What, what could happen, and this is already happening, is that existing courts, like the European Court of Human Rights, which is now considering a, a challenge from uh, in Portugal, from uh, Portuguese young people, could become much more assertive, right? And, and, and those are important, those will be important decisions. And also the International, Crimin uh, the International Court of Justice in The Hague could uh, issue what's called an, an advisory opinion, stating that the law, international law, demands more action from states with regards to climate action. Okay, we're, we're rapidly running out of time. So I'm gonna give you three quick questions that you can maybe give yeah. a, a nutshell answer. One is, uh, what is the role of like the composition of courts in different countries? You mentioned the imperviousness of Australia and the United States to international human rights law, but does, do the individual judges even make a difference? Uh, second question, uh, can you say a bit more about what could be done to address the challenge of uh, intertemporality, the, the nature of addressing the rights of future generations? And thirdly, how close are we to recognizing the rights of nature as Ecuador and some other Latin American nations have done? Mm -hmm. Let me start with the last one because I'm actively working on, 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 a, on an interesting case before the um, Ecuadorian Constitutional Court. So I see that there are, I'm glad to see this, either people from Ecuador or interested in Ecuador in this group. Um, it is a pioneer jurisdiction that in 2008, it established and enshrined the rights of nature in the constitution, thanks to uh, the proposal and all the inspiration and the ideas of the indigenous movement there. So the, the challenge there, as David shows in his book, is how to turn those declarations and those concepts that are out there and have been, have been sharpened since into actual consequences on the ground. So what is it that we, what, what, what does the right of nature uh, mean in a specific case? So uh, declaring the Amazon forest as a, as a, um, as a right, uh, subject of rights. Does it mean that, uh, uh, for example, extractive projects should be banned uh, because that would go uh, against the integrity of the territory and so on. But I think, I think this, is going, this is already happening, not just in Ecuador, but it's a, it's a trend around the world. Uh, and, and, and I think that this is one of those exciting practical and academic questions that people like you all uh, could tackle uh, creatively. And finally, I, I'll, I'll say something, sorry that I can't elaborate on each of the questions. So they're all, they're all fascinating. Um, so on the general issue of, of the usefulness of human rights. Um, my, my take is that human rights, just like Yuval Harari wrote in 21st, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, needs to be an evolving framework, right? The, so human rights, the language, the tools of human rights were created mostly to fend off attacks on or threats from governments against individuals, present generations, individuals, right? So imagine uh, um, my own region of the world, Latin America played a pioneer role. Many of the pioneering human rights organizations are from Argentina, from the Southern Cone, 1970s. And the, the whole uh, challenge there is, was to protect individuals who were being quote unquote disappeared by the dictatorships. This is crucial, but today's challenges are coming from the likes of social platforms that are completely unaccountable to individuals that are manipulating people's behaviors without any accountability or from, uh, or from governments and corporations that continue to irresponsibly emit uh, huge amounts of carbon and, or from uh, or the lack of coordination at the global level in response to a pandemic. 
uh, and uh, at a moment in which we know that the very uh, possibility of, of a habitable planet is at stake. So unless the, the conceptual and the practical tools of human race are updated, for example, by fully, to answer one of the questions, uh, fully incorporating the rights of future generations into the whole arsenal, uh, the legal framework, the, the, the jurisprudence, um, I, human rights may become an, a, a less useful, even irrelevant uh, discourse. I don't think that that's going to happen, but it will take active work, uh, both on the scholarly and on the advocacy sides. And the question about the composition of courts? The question about? Uh, the composition of courts and where, where the way that a court is uh, put oh, together, yeah. the yes. nature of, of individual course, Of judges. course, that, that, is, that is crucial. That is crucial, as you know, in, in this country at the moment, and you know, the legal battle is ongoing about the composition uh, of the courts. So the composition of courts, uh, of course, does matter. But this is where uh, my, uh, my respect for the idea of the law and the rule of, rule of law comes out. In functioning democracies in which the rule of law operates even imperfectly, and this is not just in the global north, but also in the global south, the best judges and this, and, and there are many cases or many instances of these courts, set aside at least partly their own ideological preferences and put on the head of their judicial role, right? And this has happened, I've seen that happen in many courts. Uh, and when that happens, well, the court, compositions, uh, court composition is not the only factor that comes in. So for example, deference to international uh, agreements, deference to the international scientific consensus has made a difference, for instance, in cases in Latin America or in Europe, in which even uh, court uh, judges that would be more conservative on other issues have signed off on, on progressive and, and protective legal rulings on climate change. Uh, another question here is, um, are there particular classes of evidence that are key for cases? So, or, you know, uh, that, that would be a, an interesting question yes. to explore. Yes, that, that, that's crucial. And uh, for all of you who are doing climate science or environmental science, this is crucial because lawyers need the evidence. And this is where, of course, there is maybe a cognitive uh, disconnect. And, and judges are, of course, not climate experts. Uh, they are part of the public. They are informed uh, citizens, but they need the best tools and the best evidence on issues like attribution. Right? What, what difference uh, has, uh, uh, say, the, the action or the behavior of a specific government uh, agent or a corporate actor made for the protection or the violation of, 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 uh, of, uh, of human rights. Uh, 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 evidence like the, the type of evidence that Rikidi, a well-known um, expert in climate and carbon emissions has compiled on how many tons of carbon have been released through the burning of fossil fuels dug out by the, by the top 20 um, fossil fuel companies. All of that, would continue to make judges more confident about drawing conclusions, extracting conclusions from uh, the, um, the arguments being made before them about the responsibility of governments and corporations for climate change. Okay, and um, Kai asked, going back to injury, Kai asked, why is it a problem that everyone is harmed? And I know you discussed this uh, a bit, but. Mm. Maybe you could just elaborate on does yeah. this, does this yeah, problem it's a, it's apply? A, it's a good question as well. It's a good question as well. I think it, again, this goes back to utilitarian thinking. So uh, you may be familiar with the notion of, of uh, common goods uh, and, uh, and, or, or public goods as they're known in economic um, uh, frameworks. So basically this is, the problem is that just like, uh, just like uh, the, uh, the clean air, Right? The question is, well, if you sue someone uh, uh, for polluting the air, or you had done this uh, some decades ago, the defendant could have said, well, but I can't stop 
polluting the air, but then all these cars are uh, polluting the air as well. And there's this other factory and there's this other countries and, the, and there's transboundary pollution. So what difference does it make for me as an individual to stop polluting if everyone is, is, is polluting? So, and this is uh, extrapolating this example to the more complex case of climate change. The, the conventional response by governments is pretty much along the same lines. So the Dutch government in their gender case said exactly the same. Well, I can, well, why, why should a small country, right, like the Netherlands, bear the brunt of mitigating carbon emissions if the US is doing nothing, if China is not doing enough, if Brazil, if the, temp, if the top 10 polluters are not doing enough, even Canada, right? So they're not doing uh, as much uh, as they should. So, the, and this is, this, is a, this is an impossible argument, kind of a, a vicious circle, an argumentative vicious circle that has been used very effectively to frustrate international negotiations. And because this is the same logic, unless China commits, the US won't commit and, and, and vice versa. The, the beautiful development here, the interesting development is that the, um, the courts are, are flipping that consequentialist argument on its head and saying, well, from a human rights perspective, from an ethic of responsibility perspective, I will do the right thing regardless uh, uh, of what anyone does. And if every, and if this behavior is contagious, if this becomes the rule, the normal behavior, then we'll solve the collective action problem. And one final question, and I, I confess this is my own question, but why is it that Latin America is really at the forefront of this evolving jurisprudence on climate change and human rights? The Colombian case, the Brazilian case, both of which you mentioned. I think, it, well, it's, it's a combination of, of Europe uh, and Latin America. And I think that this, the reasons are similar to the reasons behind the uh, wave of litigation on socioeconomic rights in, uh, in both uh, regions, uh, mainly a combination of strong social movements, uh, a, a well-established culture of legality, uh, meaning that legality, meaning that in many countries, the law of uh, uh, governments tend to be deferential to courts, will comply with the rulings. And then a, a more recent development, which is that a generation of, of lawyers and, uh, and advocates have been uh, very active in mobilizing the law for uh, social change causes. Well, I think we'll, we'll close it there. Thank you so much, Cesar, for, for your presentation, your insightful uh, answers to our questions, and, and more importantly, for the work that you're doing in the world. It's been a great pleasure to have you with us. And I, I hope that in 2021 or 2022, we can have the pleasure of your company here in Vancouver. Thank you so much, David. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Cesar. That was fabulous. I'm sure <laughs> we only get remote electronic claps now but really thank you again <laughs> thank you much. Dave. okay you can see the with you chat all. box filling up fun. terry do you Thanks. want to mention next week's seminar do we know what the topic is i don't actually have that in front of me but i will circulate it but if uh chris shank or one of the students is there they'll let us know it's a student-led one i guess it'll come around Yes, I think it's a student seminar with Lewis and Balshir uh, presenting. Oh, right. oh great. Fantastic. Thank you, Rudri. Thanks, Rudri. Looking forward to that. Bye, everyone. I will see you next week. Stay well and thank you again, Cesar.